Hi, I'm Brian, and I'm a game show junkie. Do you remember a time when all you needed to have a blast with somebody was a piece of paper and a pencil? Of course you don't, because you're living in the age of technology. Before the explosion of technology, little kids played a simple game called tic-tac-toe. The object was to get three X's or O's in a row. Years later, the simple concept was transformed into the game of strategy, knowledge, and fun. It's tic-tac-toe! Like usual, I'll be talking about the syndicated version mostly, but I'll bring up the older versions here and there. So if you're ready, let's dive in. Tic-Tac-Doe mixes trivia with the kids' game Tic-Tac-Toe. Two contestants play. One is X, the champion, and the other is O, the challenger. After the nine categories were displayed and read by the host, the champion selects the first category. A question in one of the outer eight boxes added $200 to the pot, and a more difficult question in the middle box added $300. The center box was always a two-part question, so the contestant was given a few seconds to think over their answer. Originally, after each player got a question, the categories were shuffled throughout the remaining boxes. Shortly into the run, they changed the rules so the board was shuffled after each question. The object was to make three X's or O's in a row horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. The first to do so won the money in the pot and went on to play the bonus game. If neither got three in a row, a new game was started with nine new categories, and the pot continued to grow with every correct answer until someone got tic-tac-doe. The bonus game showed the winner standing next to the big board looking at nine numbers. Behind six were denominations of cash between $100 and $500. Two had the words tick and tack, and finally the last number had the dragon. The object was to pick numbers one at a time in hopes to reach $1,000 before picking the dragon. If they did it or picked the tick and tack, they won the money, plus a prize package between $2,500 and $5,000. If they found the dragon, they lost everything. If Bill Cullen is the emperor of game show hosts, then Wink Martindale is the king of game show hosts. After being the host of other hit local and national shows throughout the 60s and 70s, Tic-Tac-Doe was Wink's most successful and longest-lasting gig. Wink showed both game show fans and students when to talk, when to listen, and when to slip in a joke. Who takes these classes? Uh, prospective jewelers, people who just want to know for their own information, and people who want to buy and want to know what they're doing, say, if they want to buy diamonds or something. Oh, yeah. When my wife Sandy and I first got engaged, I bought her what is known lovingly as an Arkansas diamond ring. In other words, it had very little rock on it. <laughs> it little rock. Very, you could hardly see it. You might want to applaud. And then you might not want to. <laughs> Most of the time, Wink would seem subdued when just talking, but once somebody won the game or the bonus game, his enthusiasm would always pick up. All of you said four. Cross your fingers. To go with $400, tack, you win. was a quickie, yeah, wow. After Wink left to host his own creation, Headline Chasers, the final season was hosted by newcomer Jim Caldwell. Jim wasn't as comfortable at first, but progressively got better. John C. Mueller was at it again, creating a gorgeous set for this popular XNO game. Like Joker's Wild, the contestants were stage left, the host was stage right, and the star of the show was front and center. In this case, the star was the big board. The board was made up of nine Apple II monitors controlling digital graphics. Each box was surrounded by a square of lights to signify which category was being played. Finally, many more lights were connected into the familiar tic-tac-toe grid. 
Additionally, an oval of X's and O's and chasing lights were placed behind the player for additional effect. The show logo behind Wink housed a hidden monitor used for visual questions, such as showing pictures, jumbled words, or foreign words. The set never changed for the first seven seasons, and by 1985 was showing its age. In fact, here's what Kit Salisbury, the second all-time money winner on the show, said about the set. Uh, first of all, the studio itself was kind of uh, a dump. They had mm -hmm. chicken wire on the walls, and uh, you know, it's not as glamorous as it looks on TV. Really? You win almost $200,000 and you have the nerve to call the set a dump? I wonder what he would have called it if he got nothing but Lee Press-On nails. So for the final season, Dennis Roof gave the set a much-needed overhaul. He took away the 70s Woody feel and gave it a more colorful feel. The X's were green and the O's were blue. The solid color beside the board was changed to gray squares with X's and O's. Plus, the logo behind the host was given a more colorful look. Game show musical genius Hal Heidi composed the single greatest game show theme of all time. The first few notes are supposed to resemble people clapping their hands, and you can't help but clap throughout the entire theme. Take a listen and see if you can stop clapping. This is also one of the only theme songs where the middle was my favorite part and was unfortunately only heard while the show was ending. I don't know why, but I can listen to that part all day. Uh, sorry. Besides the normal dings and buzzes, they also had special sound effects. In the main game, they had a ticking clock coupled with synthesized sound while the contestants thought over their answer. Think about it for a few seconds, will you please? The bonus round had a number reveal sound followed by two different pings throughout the run. On the board, let's look behind two, $400. What do we have? Four Bartha behind one, $300. But the most engaging sound was if the dragon was found, he would roar. Now, behind number three for Linda, we have... Normally, I don't talk about a show's technology. In the case of Tic-Tac-Doe, I will, because it set the stage for how technological advances would make game show productions much more easier to accomplish. On the old show in the 1950s, the categories were displayed on a rolling drum, which had a different category on each side. After each player answered a question, the categories spun, or shuffled, to new positions on the board. The new show had the categories Numbers, Dollars, and Dragon loaded onto an Altair 8800 computer, and displayed through nine Apple II monitors. This made shuffling the categories easy and seamless. <music> After
After a strong first season, the producers wanted to shake up the game a bit. This was the introduction of the special categories, which had a red background, as opposed to any other category, which had a blue background. The first of these was called the Secret Category. It worked similar to the Joker's Wild Mystery Category. Since the question can be on anything, a correct answer doubled the value of the pot at that time. A couple of times, this led to large pots. I'll go for the secret category, Wink. The secret category, Tom O'Connor, is best sellers. Answer the question correctly and the pot will jump to $8,200. A best seller entitled Andersonville was an historical novel about an infamous prisoner of war camp. For a pot of $8,200, during which war was this novel set? Civil War. Yes! The pot is now worth $8,200. Let's move the categories around. Get involved in big money like this, I get very, very, very nervous. Peter. Secret category in the middle there. For the third time in a row, I don't know that this has ever happened. Three secret categories in a row, Peter. Answer this question correctly, and the pot will double, remember, to $16,400. This blackish purple fruit is sometimes called an aubergine. To make that pot jump to $16,400, and for a vertical block, by what more common name do we know it? Eggplant. You got it! For a block. Let's jump the Now, where would you like to move? The secret category to block. Fourth time in a row for a horizontal block of Peter. Each year, the Mystery Writers of America give awards to the authors of mystery and crime books. The award is named for the American author who wrote such chillers as The Pit and the Pendulum. To block Peter and to make our pot jump to $32,800, I want you to name him. Edgar Allan Poe. Yes, that's right. <laughs> As time went on, they added more special categories, which led them to use three per game. Many critics complain this made the game move too fast. The biggest culprit of this is the bonus category, a single question with three parts to answer. If the player succeeded, they immediately got another turn. At least if a player blitzed the game like this, they would let the loser come back for another game and be guaranteed a chance to play. Other interesting special categories through the run include Seesaw, where players would seesaw back and forth giving answers until someone repeated an answer, gave a wrong answer, or took too long. But the one that showed people how gutsy or smart you are was Auction. A question was given with a number of answers. The players bid on how many answers they could give. The high bidder gets control. This led to one of the greatest moments in the history of the show. The question again, 14 American states which have at least some part of their coastline on the Atlantic Ocean. You say you can name all 14. Kit, if you do this, you'll have a successful block and we'll have a tie game. Go. Florida. Florida is one. Georgia. Georgia is one. South Carolina. South Carolina. North Carolina. Just one moment, please. South Carolina is one. North Carolina, you name, that's one. Virginia. Virginia is one. You've named five of 14. Maine. Maine is another. Quiet, please, audience. New Hampshire. New Hampshire is another. Massachusetts. Massachusetts is one. Continue. Rhode Island. Rhode Island is another. Connecticut. Connecticut is one. New York. New York is one. You need one, two, three more. New Jersey. New Jersey is one. You need two more. Maryland. Maryland is one. You need one more for a successful block hit and a second tie game. Delaware. You got it! Tic-Tac-Doe's catchphrase is the most exciting, but is one of the more memorable ones because of the way Wink Martindale delivered it. 
when the player gave a winning answer, he would proclaim, You have Tic Tac Doe! For Tic Tac Doe and $1,100, name the detective. Sherlock Holmes. You have Tic Tac Doe. <laughs> Martha, you took the category. You get to go first. What do you think? Return of the Jedi. You have Tic Tac Doe! <laughs> There you have it, Tic-Tac-Doe, a trivia game born from a pencil and paper game. Fans who were growing up in the late 70s when these shows were both popular wondered if you threw Tic-Tac-Doe and the Joker's Wild in a blunder, what would it become? That question will be answered next time. Until then, I'm Brian, your game show junkie, saying, see you then.